My name is my name is Ryan Johnson, and I am a customer success manager here at our studio. Uh, I've been at our studio now for coming up on three years. Um, so I am based in the U.S. I live right outside of Washington D.C. and Maryland. Uh, but like Mohammed mentioned, me and my colleague Lauren Chadwick, we're actually going to be flying over to England in a couple of days here uh, for the NHS um, our conference, which we're pretty excited about. So hopefully, we'll see some of you in person. Um, just a little bit about me. So before I joined our studio, my background is actually in microbiology and immunology. Um, so I worked as a staff scientist, uh, more bioinformatics. I uh, did a lot of uh, bacterial genetics, all that fun stuff. Um, very quickly, my life turned into writing grants, and that's not how I wanted to spend it. Um, and I found that I was really more passionate about the data science, data analysis, and using our studio, which uh, led me eventually to uh, joining the company. So for today's session, we are going to, it's gonna be a two-parter. We'll have a little break in between. The first part is going to be an introduction to Shiny. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen, but I'll continue to kind of set the stage here. So for today's session to start off, uh, this introduction to Shiny, it's really going to assume that folks here in the line are relatively new to Shiny. Now you may have created some Shiny applications, you may be an expert, um, but for those on the line that may have never even heard of Shiny or may have heard of it and just not quite sure how to use it, this presentation is going to be for you. So we're gonna get everyone up to speed on how to uh, basically create a Shiny application, what goes uh, into a Shiny application. And then the second part will be a little bit more advanced topics. Now, maybe stuff that is a little bit more advanced for those that are brand new to Shiny, but it's still good to get exposed to it. And then for those that are a little bit more proficient with Shiny, hopefully you'll get some, uh, some good uh, tips and tricks out of it. Now, for kind of your role in this session, uh, there's really kind of two options. Uh, you have the option to just sit back, relax, watch, just take it all in. Like Mohammed mentioned, this is being recorded. You can rewatch it at your leisure but there will be a few opportunities if you want to do more interactive learning, right? So in the chat, uh, we should have shared an instance of RStudio Cloud. RStudio Cloud is a hosted service that we provide at RStudio that basically gives you access to the RStudio IDE to do some lightweight data analysis. And I've created within this RStudio Cloud instance, two separate assignments. So we have an intro to Shiny and we have advanced Shiny. And so if you have an RStudio Cloud account, they are free. Um, you can just log in. And to start, we're going to kick off with this intro to Shiny um, session. Right? For the most part, this is just going to be a blank environment. There's nothing in it. And the other RStudio Cloud, uh, the advanced Shiny, there'll be a, a few more uh, applications to do here. But if you want to follow along using RStudio Cloud, this is option number one. Right? So here's just a blank RStudio session. Uh, and we'll go over this uh, here in a second. All right, and then if you do have questions, I highly encourage folks to post them into the chat. Um, very likely there's gonna be someone else on the line that can probably answer your question for you. But if we do have time towards the end, I'll try to rattle off a few uh, uh, questions and try to give you some answers. All right, so with that set up, let's go ahead and dive into it. So what is Shiny? So I thought that you know, I could just kind of explain what Shiny is, but that's kind of boring. I thought it'd be a little bit more fun if folks on the line actually explored Shiny you know, for yourselves. So if you've never heard of Shiny, never used Shiny, we have this website called our Shiny Gallery. And this just has a ton of example Shiny applications. You can see all these thumbnails. These are Shiny apps that you can click, you can actually interact with. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna post this link into the chat. And I want folks to just take uh, a few minutes here and just explore some applications. See some of the cool things you can do uh, with the, the, the Shiny applications. All right, so take one or two minutes. I just posted that link to the chat. Explore Shiny at your own leisure.
And if you don't have that our studio cloud link, I'll just repost it here into the chat as well. I right, say so 30 more seconds. Again, we're just exploring some various applications in that shiny gallery. This is a really cool tool, especially if you're trying to get some inspiration for some applications you want to create, because not only can you interact with these applications, but you can see all the code uh, behind the scenes as well. All right. So let's come back to the slides here and let's talk a little bit more about what exactly Shiny is. So hopefully by exploring some of those example applications, you're kind of getting a feel of what Shiny applications can do. Well, let's actually talk about what is Shiny itself. First and foremost, Shiny is an open source R package. All right, open source meaning that it is completely free. If you have a computer and you have internet access, you can create a Shiny application. There's absolutely no charge to create a Shiny app. Shiny allows you to build web applications using just R, right? So you don't need to know anything about HTML, JavaScript, CSS, any of these other kind of scripting languages. You only need to know R. And in fact, you only need to know a little bit of R to be uh, really uh, dangerous with Shiny, so to speak. It's also code based. This is something that we believe pretty heavily here at our studio is that data science should be code based and Shiny is no exception to this. Things that are code based are more traceable, they're extensible, they're trackable. Uh, it just makes for a better uh, data science experience. And they're extremely customizable. So if you have an idea, you can dream it. In R, you can probably build it using Shiny. And yes, did I mention it's completely free? So again, I mentioned there's a few different ways that we can, uh, if you want to follow along more interactively, I do have that RStudio Cloud instance, that link is posted into the chat. This is again, a blank RStudio session, and I'll get everyone up to speed with the RStudio IDE if you're not uh, familiar with it. Uh, but that RStudio Cloud instance, it has Shiny already installed for you. Now you do have uh, another option. If you have RStudio installed on your personal computer uh, as RStudio desktop, or you have an instance of RStudio Workbench, which is our server-based implementation of RStudio, you can log in there and just make sure you have Shiny installed. Right? If you have those two requirements, then you can follow along with everything we'll do today. So let's go ahead and just create a Shiny application. Uh, one of the, the best parts about the RStudio IDE is it actually comes with a pre-built Shiny application in it. And so we're going to go ahead and we're going to create the Shiny application. We're going to assign it a name down here in step two, where we want to save it, and then we're going to run the application. All right, so we can do this within RStudio Cloud. Um, so I'll show you how to do it in RStudio Cloud, and I'm also going to do it within RStudio Workbench. But here in the top left corner, you can see this little green plus button. Go ahead and click on this. And we have Shiny Web App. All right, once you click on that button, you're going to get this little pop-up menu. We can call this whatever you want. I'll just call mine Test App. And I'll hit Create. All right, so now we have our Shiny application. So this code you see on the left-hand side of your screen, kind of this top left quadrant, this is our source code pane. This is a Shiny application. I mentioned before it is code based. So everything you see here is our code. Down here in the bottom left, we have our console. So this is kind of a, a live uh, R session where you can you know, actually plug in some R code like two plus two equals four. We have our environment pane over here in the top right. And then we also have our file directory in the bottom right corner. So once you have your Shiny application um, here in the top left, you should see a little button called run application. All right. If you click on the little arrow next to it, you have an option to run it in the viewer pane or run it in the window. Totally your choice. I just prefer to have it in a viewer pane. And when you do that, you click the run application and slide this to the left and slide it up. Here we have a rendered Shiny application. All right. So this is cool. We already have built a Shiny application and this is kind of showing it live. So with a Shiny application, what it allows you to do is explore your data. So we have this slider bar right here and feel free to interact with it. You can slide it to the left, you can slide it to the right. 
And you can see as I do so, it changes the number of bins in this histogram, which is being shown over here on the right hand side. So this is our shiny application, the way for you to interact with your data, for example, using the slider bar. I, I also have an instance of RStudio uh, within RStudio Workbench. I'm going to do the exact same thing for anyone who just needs a quick repeat here. So here I have a blank RStudio session in RStudio Workbench. Again, I'm going to click on this top left, click Shiny Web App. We'll call this Test App, hit Create, and then run the application. Same exact thing. All right. So now we've created the Shiny application. Let's actually talk about what goes into it. Now for pretty much all Shiny applications, there's going to be two components. There's something known as the user interface or UI for short. And there's also something known as the server function. Now the user interface, this is what you see. This is what you touch, right? So when you have a rendered Shiny application, you can see right here in the top left, this is our rendered user interface. This is where you define all those inputs like the slider bar, all the outputs like this plot and where you want them positioned on your page. Again, this is what you see. This is what you touch, your user interface. Now, when a user logs into your Shiny application and they slide this bar to the left or slide it to the right, that generates what's known as an input change, right? So this slider bar is a type of input it generates an input change. This gets fed into the server portion of our Shiny application. And the server defines basically what our application is going to do. In this example, it creates a histogram. So this input change comes in here, it regenerates that histogram and it sends it back to the user interface as an output where it gets rendered back in the user interface. And this just goes around and around and around in circles for as long as you continue to interact with the Shiny application. Now for this example Shiny application, which we're going to be focusing on today, the user interface has three components. We have a title, you can see in the top left. We have that slider input right here. And then we have our graph, our histogram, which is shown in this main panel. And for the server function of our application, it's just going to do two things. It's going to receive the input from the slider, and then it's going to recreate that histogram. All right, so let's actually talk about what goes into an application. So the code chunk that you're seeing right here, believe it or not, is a fully functional Shiny application. Now, if you were to copy this code into our studio and run this application, you would see absolutely nothing. But most importantly, you would not get an error. So this is basically the scaffolding for most Shiny applications. And most apps can be broken up into four components. At the very top is something known as the header. Then we have the two components we just talked about, the user interface and the server. And then at the very end, you're going to see typically the Shiny app function, which just tells Shiny to run the application. So let's take a look at each one of these components and starting at the very top here with the header. What is it? The header is typically going to be the first part of your Shiny application. All right, so it's gonna be at the very top. Here I have uh, the code for our application that we've been working with. This is the header portion of our Shiny application, which runs from lines one to lines 10. And you can see we have a bunch of these hashes. These are just comments to the authors. So these are not actually uh, code that's actually run within a Shiny app. They're just code uh, messages to yourself. The only bit of code that's going to be run in this header is we're going to load the Shiny package. All right, we do that by running the library function. And we just give it the name of the package in this example, Shiny. Now the second point here, everything in this section will run as soon as someone connects to your application. So that's probably the ta biggest take home for the header is that if you need something to happen at the very beginning of your Shiny application, for example, load some packages like we did here, read in some data, maybe do some data transformation, run a model, anything that needs to happen as soon as someone logs into your application, you wanna put in the header. So we have some example stuff right here. Again, like loading the data, packages, data wrangling, anything like that that needs to happen at the very beginning. 
So now let's talk about the user interface. And this actually comprises the largest portion of our Shiny application. And you can see this runs from about line 12 all the way to line 33. This is typically going to be the second part of your application. And again, this defines the visual layout of your application, what you see, what you touch. It's also going to define all those inputs and how they work, such as that slider bar. It's also going to define the outputs and where they are and what types they are, such as that histogram. All right, so here again, I'm showing all the code. Well, let's take a little bit of time to break apart this code and understand exactly what's going on here. So on the left-hand side of the screen, we can see all the code for our user interface. On the right-hand side, you can actually see the rendered user interface. So I mentioned before that our user interface has three components. It has a title, you can see in the top left, our uh, slider bar input, and then we have our history and our main panel over here. For the title, you can see right here in the user interface, we have a very intuitive function called title panel. And within this function, all you have to do is give it some text to whatever you want the title to be. All right, so pretty straightforward. Uh, hopefully that's pretty simple. The next component we have is our input. All right, and that's all the code underlying this input is shown right here in this blue box. We have a slider input function. And there's a few arguments that go into this function. You can see this first one, bins. This is what's known as an input ID. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. So don't worry too much about it right now. We have our label, and you can see this is reflected exactly right here uh, in the, the rendered user interface. It just changes the label. And then the rest of the arguments are going to be typically unique to that input. So we need to define a minimum value such as one, maximum value is 50, and then the default value when someone logs into your Shiny application in this example is set to 30. And then the last part of our user interface is going to be this histogram. And so this is a type of plot. So we have this plot output function, and then we give it this arbitrary text. We're just going to call it dist plot, and this will be important. You know that we uh, we match this text to something in the server, but we'll talk about that here in a second. But that's pretty much it. These are the three components to our shiny application. So knowing what you know now, we're going to do a quick assignment. And I want you to go into your Shiny application that you already created. And I want you to make some changes to the user interface. You can do whatever you want, but I have two kind of examples. I'm just gonna take about a minute to do this. I want you to change the title of your application to something, all right? You can call it my super cool guys or data, uh, whatever you want, just change it up. And then I want you to change the maximum number of bins on the slider from 50 to some other value. You can make it 100, you can make 1,000, uh, whatever you want. So go ahead and take one minute and make these changes to your user interface and go ahead and rerun the application. I take about 15 more seconds here and then we'll do it all together. Uh, um, sorry, I can't find where is the data. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that here um, in this example, but as Priyanka mentioned here, the data is actually built into the Shiny application. Um, but it's, it's a good question. And let me actually, I'll talk a little bit to that. Yeah, but I don't know okay. what to do. So I don't know what to do, please. If you can. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. I'll walk you through. Yeah. All right. So here is our Shiny application, our default Shiny application. Again, if you, um, if you joined a little bit late, to create this Shiny application, you click on this drop down in the top left and select Shiny Web App. All right, you can call whatever you want, you can save it wherever you want, and then go ahead and hit create. All right, and once you do that, you should see something like this in the top left quadrant of your RStudio IDE. Now, if we run this application as is, 
right? So here we have an active running Shiny application, which is pretty cool. We can slide this to the left, we can slide this to the right, and you can see how that changes the number of bins in the histogram. But we wanna make some changes to this user interface. So the first assignment is that I wanted you to change the title. So we're gonna stop this application and we're gonna make some changes. So if I highlight the user interface portion of our Shiny application, that is shown right here from lines 13 to about 33. And then right here on line 16, we have our title panel. So let me go ahead and change this to something. I'm gonna say, I'll just delete Old Faithful and I'll call this my super cool geyser data and I'll add some exclamation points because I'm super excited. And then we'll run that. All right, and now you can see that we have a new title in our user interface. And now I wanna make some changes to this input, the slider input. So as you can see here, it runs from about one all the way to 50, but I wanna change that max value to something else. I'm gonna stop the application. I'll come over here, we have our slider input. The minimum value is set to one, max is 50. Let's change that to 100. And I'm gonna rerun the application. And now you can see how that's reflected in the user interface. All right, so instead of going to 50, I can slide this all the way up to 100. All right, so hopefully that it kind of shows you how you can make some small tweaks to the code that has pretty dramatic impacts on the actual look to your Shiny application. All right, let's come back to our Shiny application, our slides here, and talk about one additional component to the user interface, and that's going to be the layout. As a developer of a Shiny application, you have full control over the look, the feel, the layout of your Shiny application. Well, let's go over the layout for our example application that we've been working on. So we are actually leveraging something known as a sidebar layout, right? That is a type of layout for this uh, Shiny application. So you can see here in this pink bar, we're defining the sidebar layout function. And this layout has two panels. We have a sidebar panel, which is shown here in this pink dashed box, all right? And the only thing we have in this sidebar panel is our slider input, which is shown right here, all right? So that's our sidebar panel. And the other panel is our main panel, which is basically everything to the right of that sidebar, shown here in this blue dash box. And the only thing we have inside of this main panel is our output, our plot output, which is this histogram right here. But maybe this is not what you want, right? Maybe you want a different layout for your Shiny application and you can do that. So here are just some various UI user interface layout examples. Right here in the middle, this is the sidebar layout that we're leveraging for our example Shiny application. But you can do things like that fluid row. Uh, we're just gonna be row after row after row, as many rows as you want. You can have a flow layout where basically objects can flip down to another row depending on the width of your screen. You can do a split layout where basically you just uh, split your screen in half. Vertical layout, you have a bunch of options and you can mix and match these as well. Really the sky's the limit how you want this application to be uh, laid out. All right, so that's the user interface. We'll talk a little bit more about it in a second, but we're gonna switch gears to the server function of our application. So the server is typically the third part of your application, right? And I have the code for our server function right here, it runs from lines 35 to 48. This is where most of your R code lives. Now, as your applications grow in complexity, typically that means the server portion is gonna get larger and larger and larger. But the real take home for the server function is that it tells Shiny how to build those outputs. Now the output in our example application is that histogram. So all the code needed to create that histogram is gonna live in the server function. This last point, I'm not gonna to focus too much on it right now. We're gonna we're gonna talk about it here in a second. But basically the server needs to read in those inputs. It needs to read in that value from that slider bar. And we do that using this input dollar sign uh, ID syntax. But again, we'll talk about that here in a second. So again, just focusing in here on the code for the server function. So we have our server function right here on line 36. And within this function, we have this uh, line 38. We're gonna talk about this one here in a second, but basically starting at line 40, 
going to line 46, this is all the code needed to create the histogram. Right here on line 40, we are defining our data, right? We're using a faithful data set. This is basically built into the Shiny package. So you don't have to worry about loading your data or anything like that. When you load the Shiny package, you actually have this faithful geyser data set included. And we're only extracting the second column. Line 31, this is where we define the number of bins. And you can see it's actually taking in the input, which we'll talk about here in a second. And then starting on line 44, this is where you draw the histogram, right? We are just gonna use the histogram function. We have our data, we have the number of bins, and then we have various other arguments for this histogram, like changing the color from dark gray to something else if you wanted to. You can change the border of those um, bars in your histogram change the X label, the main label, you can do whatever you want. So now that we know a little bit more about the server and creating these outputs, we have another quick assignment. We'll just take a minute to do so. I want you to go into the server portion of the Shiny application, all right, which again, starting around line 36. And I want you to change the histogram bin color from dark gray to something else. You can make it green, blue, black, yellow, whatever you want. And then I want you to change the border color from white to black or what other color, all right? So just get a little bit more experience learning where the server function is in your application and then tweaking that histogram um, function until you can change up the appearance of that output. So go ahead and take one minute and make some changes to the, the server. I right, take so 10 more seconds and we'll do this together. All right. Let's we'll see a few folks might have a few issues here. Um, let's see if we can work those out together. All right, so let's first go through the assignment here. So I'm gonna go ahead and highlight the server portion of our Shiny application, which Ryan runs from lines 36 to 48. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and change the border color. So if we go to line 44, this is actually where we create the histogram using this histogram function. You can see the color of the bars is set to dark gray. I'm gonna change it to, uh, let's just choose yellow. You can pick whatever color you want. Let's go ahead and run this. And now you can see what our um, plot looked like. You know, the yellow on the white background doesn't look that great, but now we can see that the, the bars had changed their color, right? Because we changed the output within the server function. Let's make it look a little bit better. So instead of a white border around our bars, let's make a black border. I think that'll look nice. There we go, that looks a little bit better. So you can see how just making tweaks to the server function, right? It can change these outputs, the output being the histogram. Um, if anyone's having issues not seeing the, the plot, there might be an issue here where um, you have the screen uh, a little bit too narrow. In that case, you might see something like this. <laughs> if that's the case, just go ahead and you can kind of hover your mouse right in the center here and you can slide it over and shiny applications are smart enough that they'll actually pop over to their normal format here. All right, so I suspect that might have been a few issues here uh, that was happening. All right, cool. So we now have tweaked our server. Let's talk about some other cool things with our Shiny app. So there's only one other component to the Shiny app to go over, and that's going to be the last component. Typically, at the end of every Shiny application, there's going to be a call, the Shiny app function. This is where you basically merge the two. You have your user interface and you have the server, you wanna combine them into one. And we do that using the Shiny app function. 
So this syntax, I think it's actually a little confusing for this default application, UI equals UI, server equals server. So let me actually explain what's going on here by running through an example. Let me scroll up to the user interface. All right, so we have our user interface right here. And you can see everything in the user interface is being saved to a variable called UI. But you can call this whatever you want. I'm gonna say UI underscore, whoops, my app. All right, this is an example. And then if I go down to the server portion, so if I highlight that right here, you can see everything is being saved as a function. This function is literally called server, but you can call this whatever you want. So I can do underscore my app, for example. Now, if I go to run this application, I hit run app, it's actually not working. You can see down here in the console, I'm getting an error saying uh, object server not found. So what we basically need to do is go to line 51 and we need to tell this application what's our user interface variable and what's our server function. Since we changed those names, I'm gonna go ahead and put UI my app and then server is server my app. And then we'll rerun this and now it works just fine. Okay. So again, you can save the server function to whatever you want and the user interface to whatever you want. You just need to combine those two into that last line of code. All right, so now I wanna talk about probably one of the most um, exciting parts of Shiny, all right? And this is going to be this concept of inputs and outputs and also reactivity. So it was a quick reminder for users that interact with your Shiny application. All right, so you have your user interface here. A user logs in and they can slide this bar to the left and they can slide it to the right. That generates these input changes. These input changes are fed into the server. The server reruns the code. It basically reacts to that change. It reruns all the code to draw that histogram. That histogram is sent back to the user interface and this just goes around and around and around in circles. All right. So let's talk just a little bit about these inputs. So all inputs for Shiny are typically going to behave fairly similarly. So you have an input of choice. The first two arguments are always going to be this input ID and a label. So you can see with our slider input for our example application, our input ID is going to be bins. You can call us whatever you want, but you want it to be intuitive. If this slider here changes the number of bins in your histogram, then yeah, bins seems like a logical choice uh, for an input ID. And then the label, again, can be whatever you want, and that's just going to be reflected right here. Now, I also want to highlight over here on the left-hand side of the screen, these are some various inputs that are built into Shiny, and hopefully, depending on your needs, you can find an input uh, that meets those needs. So you have things like action buttons, you can click links, uh, check boxes, you can have dates and date ranges, uh, password inputs, numeric inputs, radio buttons, all these great inputs. You can also see our slider bar right down here towards the bottom. But if you look at the code underlying all these inputs, you can see that every single one of them has this input ID and a label. So when you have an input like this, like our slider input, right, we have our uh, minimum, maximum, default value, this input literally returns the number of 30, right? If I slid it to the left to six, it would return the number six. If I went all the way up to 50, it would return the number 50. The question then becomes, how do we get this number and feed it into the server? We do that using the strange syntax that I alluded to before, input dollar sign, and then you feed it the input ID that matches your input. All right, so you remember slider bar input, we gave it the input ID bins, we match that input right down here. So now this number 30 gets fed and it basically replaces this syntax right here. So this becomes 30. If I slide this to the left, this updates and all the code to generate this histogram reacts to that change and reruns, it regenerates that histogram. I slide this to the right, this gets changed, it recognizes that input, Shiny reacts to that and it rebuilds my histogram. All right, so we have all this code now for our histogram. You can see that input uh, changes the number of bins in our histogram. And then we need to create an output. 
All right, so we have this histogram, uh, which again, we're gonna call this output dog sign dispot. I'll talk more about that here in a second. But all this code, you can see lines 40 to 46, all the code to generate our histogram is all within something known as a render plot function. Now, depending on what you're creating, whether it be a plot, could be a table, could be some text, it could be an image, you wanna match the render function to that uh, output. So here's what I mean by that. So we're creating a plot in our example. We're creating a histogram, it's a type of plot. So we obviously wanna use a render plot function. But if you're creating a table, you wanna use render table or maybe render data table, maybe you're rendering an image or maybe a, another component to the user interface or some text, just make sure you use the correct render function when creating outputs. All right, so we're rendering a plot right here and we're gonna save that to output dollar sign something. We're calling it displot in this example. You can call it whatever you want. And this syntax should look pretty sim, uh, familiar, right? Because we have this input dollar sign down here, output dollar sign up here. By saving it as output dollar sign displot, this allows us to take this output that we just built, this plot, and send it back to the user interface. And you just have to make sure you match whatever after this dollar sign, so displot, to whatever is being shown here in the user interface in the main panel. All right, so once those match, that allows us to actually show this output, this plot in the main panel of our user interface. So this concept of reactivity inputs and outputs, it always tends to be the most kind of complicated part of Shiny. So I always encourage folks to play around with this application, you know, create new outputs, maybe change the names around a little bit, see how that uh, affects the behavior of a Shiny application. But there's a few additional kind of rules and we'll also kind of recap here, just kind of drive the point home. So for the server function of your application, all right, basically everything from line 36 here to 48, there's really three rules for all server functions. Number one, any object you want to display on the user interface, such as that plot, the histogram, you need to save it as an output dollar sign something. We're calling it displot in our example. And you wanna build these outputs, these objects using a render function. So if you're rendering a plot, make sure you use render plot. If you're rendering a table, use render table. And then the last one, in order to access those input values, such as the value from our slider bar, make sure you access those using input dollar sign and then match that input ID. We did that down here with the input dollar sign bins, which was the input ID for our slider bar. All right, another way to review here is the reactivity. So again, we have our Shiny application kind of up here in the top. We have our uh, user interface, a user slides us far left and right that generates an input change. It's fed into the server, server recreates a histogram, sends it back to the user interface. So what does that look like for the underlying code? So again, we have our slider input code and we have the input ID of bins. We feed that into the server by using input dollar sign bins. That regenerates the code or re reruns all the code and regenerates that plot, the histogram, which we have in the render plot and we save it as output dollar sign. We're just gonna call it displot. And we feed that back to the user interface and we recognize it here using this plot output function and we match the text right here, all right? And again, this just goes around and around and around. All right, so that's hopefully just a brief overview of what goes into most Shiny applications. You know, we have our header, user interface, server, and then that run app function. So I'm gonna talk about a few additional things um, before we take a quick break and we talk about some more advanced topics. The first thing I wanted to mention is saving your Shiny application. So for our application, right, we have here, you can see everything is within the single app.r script. Now, as your Shiny applications grow in complexity, you do have the option to split your application in half, all right? So you can have a single script right here, which is on the left-hand side, but you can also split up the user interface and the server into two separate scripts. So we have a ui.r up here and a server.r down here. This is good, especially if your applications, again, are growing larger and larger and larger, might be thousands of lines of code. This can be a good way to make it a little bit more digestible. And Shiny uh, within our Studio ID is still smart enough to recognize these two files as a single Shiny application. 
but really the most important thing is, you know, you've created the shiny application. How do you share it with people that need to see it, right? Whether that be yourself, maybe one of your colleagues, your boss, or maybe something you're really proud of and you want to share it with your friends and family. How do you actually share an application? So I want to just quickly go over a few options you have um, that we provide from here at our studio. The first one is known as shinyapps.io. This is actually a hosted service that we provide and there is a free tier associated with it, which allows you to take your applications and host them onto a server that again, we host. Uh, and then you can share that application like you would a uh, any other website. So shinyapps.io is a great, and again, it's a free tier. So if you just have like one or two applications you wanna share with a handful of people, shinyapps.io uh, is a great option. We do have an open source tool where if you have a Linux server, you can um, install Shiny server onto that uh, Linux server and basically run a single application from that dedicated instance. Now there will require some kind of IT, some administrative configuration uh, controls for that um, for Shiny server, but it is a free option for hosting a Shiny application. But what we would recommend for teams that do have access to this tool is something known as RStudio Connect, right? This is our professional publishing platform where you can host Shiny applications and have full control how you can share them. So I just wanna quickly show you this workflow. So again, this won't be anything that you'll have to do. You can just kind of sit back, relax and watch me as I deploy the application we just created to RStudio Connect. All right, so I'm gonna do this within the context of RStudio Workbench. Um, you can do this from the RStudio ID you know, on your desktop as well. You just have to make sure that you have access to an instance of RStudio Connect. So here's our application within our studio. Again, I can run it and you can see our output. You can see our slider bar. Now I want to share this application with everyone here on the line. How do I do that? You'll see right next to this run app button, there's this little blue eyeball looking button. This is our publishing button. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on this. We're gonna get a pop-up menu that says, what files do you wanna publish? So we just have this single shiny app, this app.r. So let's make sure that's checked. Here is where you need to define an RStudio Connect server. Now, here at RStudio, we call our demo servers Colorado. I have no idea why. This is what we call it. And then you can call it whatever you want. So I'll call it test app. I'm just gonna give it some random numbers just to make sure there's no duplicate test apps on our server and I'll hit publish. And that's it, All right? RStudio takes care of the rest. It takes a snapshot of my environment, matches my environment on RStudio Connect. You'll see some text kind of coming through here, some logs should go pretty quick. All right, I got to log in. So it's one of the other benefits here. Varsity Connect is a layer of authentication. And let's give it one second. You can see here the name of our application. And now on an instance of our Studio Connect, and here we have our running Shiny application. All right, now I'm not gonna go into the details of all the cool things you can do with Shiny applications, but I do want to show you how easy it is to share applications with folks. So as a publisher, I now have control over who has access to my application. I can choose to make it available to specific users or groups, and you can define those groups right down here. So currently I'm the only one that can see this application. That's me right there. Now your um, other account manager here at our studio is Lauren Chadwick. So if I wanted to make her uh, a viewer of this application as well, I can add her and be very specific over who I want access to this application. Now I have a few additional controls. I can make it so that anyone, as long as they can log into our studio connect, they can view this content, All right? So they still need to have the login credentials to the server. Basically, this would be anybody who can, um, uh, at our studio that has access to the server can access it. Or I can make it anyone no login required. Now in this configuration, basically, if you have access to this URL you see at the top here, you can view this application. You can also see that this URL is not the prettiest URL. You can actually change that. So I can just come down here and I can say NHSR, for example, kind of create a nice vanity URL. And I'm gonna copy this URL and I post it into the chat here. 
And this is how easy it is to share Shiny applications using RCU Connect. So it's literally just a URL. And one of the nice things is that the folks who are viewing the Shiny application, so all of you on the line, you actually don't even have to have R installed on your computer or anything like that. You just need access to the internet to view this content. All right, so that's just a quick primer in RCU Connect. I'm just gonna wrap things up here and then we'll take a quick break and I'll also kick around in case there's any questions. But just as a quick recap, hopefully now you have a little bit better understanding of the basic structure of a Shiny application, right? Those four main components, such as customizing the Shiny user interface, the Shiny server and those various rules that we talked about, inputs, outputs, and also ways to save and publish your application. Now, if you want to keep learning about Shiny, we have so many awesome tutorials, things here at our studio, and also just the greater R Shiny community. There's always people creating really awesome tutorials uh, and things to help with your Shiny development. But the only resource, well, two resources that I want to highlight here is the Shiny Cheat Sheet and Mastering Shiny. I think this is a slightly outdated one, but if you go to the R Studio, or actually if you just Google like R Studio Shiny Cheat Sheet, you're gonna get a PDF. This PDF is going to be a front and back. I would highly recommend you just print this out, laminate it, stick it next to your computer. This is a great way so you're not constantly referring back to the documentation, you know, what's that function name, you know, what's those arguments that go into it. This is a great way to um, have a quick access to some of the more common tools and functions within Shiny. And then if you really are interested in learning more about Shiny, I can't recommend this book enough. This is a completely free book, all right? Online is completely free. You can buy a hard copy if you want as well. But this was written by Hadley Wickham. Some folks may have heard of Hadley. He's our chief data scientist here at our studio. And this book walks you through everything from creating your very first Shiny application. You can see that here in chapter one to gradually working your way through more advanced topics. Okay, so again, this is completely free, has all various code chunks you can copy directly into the RStudio ID and try to play around with it. All right, so that's pretty much everything for this intro to Shiny um, portion. And so what we can probably do is take a 10 minute break. Maybe we can meet back up at the top of the hour um, and we'll start going into our advanced Shiny portion. So feel free to take a break, um, grab some water, go to the bathroom. Um, I'll kick around in case there's any questions uh, folks may have. Um, from you there. Yes, I can hear you, but it's a little hard to, to hear your audio. Okay, I'm um, sorry. Um, I'm having difficulty having the, um, the Instagram using it on the cloud. So the studio cloud, I can't get the Instagram working. And I think few of my colleagues there, they've said the same thing. So we don't know why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me um, just quickly walk through this workflow. And then I think I may know what's happening, um, but I could be wrong. Uh, let me just double check. So. Are you able to get to the point that you see on my screen right here? Yes. Do you have the application? Okay. Yeah. And when you click on when you click on this run app button, uh, what happens? Okay, I'm gonna do it again now. Okay. Um, when when I click, okay, it's coming up now. I can only see the number of bins. Yeah, when you click on that, the run half. Yeah, you click on yours. Yeah, I could see, oh, I, yeah, the old faithful Gilford data. That is the only one I could see. All right, do you see anything like, does it look like kind of like this on your screen? Um, um, no, I can only see the old, old faithful. I think what is done for me is come up on another tab. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, hold on. I think let me see. I'm seeing something else now. Let me see. Oh. 
Oh no, nothing, nothing. It's just empty, yes. I don't know why. So I'm just going to try my desktop. If it's my um, well, well, really quick, um, if you don't mind, um, are you actually able to share your screen so I can take a quick look? Would that be possible? Oh. If it's possible, um, okay, let me see if it's possible. Yeah, I've, uh, Ryan, I've just enabled uh, multiple screen sharing. So hopefully okay. our colleagues should be able to, um, uh, to share a screen. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now if it's possible. Okay. Can you see? Yes. I, you yes. can see your screen, yes. Yeah. Oh, can you see the... Shiny. I cannot. No, you, um, you cannot. Can, you're focused on uh, on the blog page. Why don't you close all some of your other pages? <laughs> uh, but but anyways, if you go to the shiny screen, then I think uh, the shiny tab, then Ryan will be able to look. Okay. Yeah. So if you click on this tab right here, oh, there you go. Perfect. Can you see now? Yes. Okay. You got it. So, yeah. So go ahead. Um, see that little stop sign symbol? This one? No. I'm going to go ahead and use my annotator here. So, in this right here, can you see that? Little stop sign? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, right there. Go ahead and clear that or go ahead and click that. Yeah. All right, so, all right, once, do, 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 do. All right, why don't we just go ahead and do this? Why don't you go ahead and just refresh your page? Um, so on the top left, just refresh this, your, this page. I can't see. So go ahead and click on, let me get my, Annotator here, right up here. Let's go ahead and refresh this. Uh, refresh right up here. Oh. <laughs> All right. Now go ahead and try clicking on that run app button again. Let's see what it looks like. Okay, I think um, you hit the stop sign one more time. Ryan, there's a oh, suggestion stop. that the, the, the app name should be test underscore app and not test one. Can I just close it? That's not it. I'm just going to come out. Um, yeah, the, the names should not matter. Um, okay. okay. But uh, go ahead, um, if, you, if you can go ahead and stop your application again. So I think that stop sign I've highlighted here in red. Yep, there okay. you go. Um, now what I'd like you to do is okay. um, right next to the run app button, um, go ahead and just click somewhere to get rid of that menu. Yep, see the little drop down menu right here next to the run app. I'm trying to highlight it here. Yeah. So don't click run app, yep, click that. And do click run in viewer pane. Nope, run in viewer pane. Perfect. And now let's try running application. So now I want you to click on this one. Yep. Oh, wow. Okay, so, same. yep. No, no. So you're, you're seeing exactly what you expect to see. I want you to take your cursor and actually hover it over this bar. All right, so you can change the width and the height of these various boxes. So I want you, so not the viewer tab, but like literally that bar. Yep, right there. See your cursor, so click and drag up. There you go. And then do the same thing for this bar right here. Click it and drag it to the left. Now your application, yep. Um, this side. 
Yeah, so what I think is happening is your screen is very compressed. Um, so you might need to find a way to um, oh. zoom out a little bit. Um, because it's just the shiny application, basically it doesn't have room to render. It's what's ultimately right. the issue okay. here. Okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll try and use my desktop later if that's the problem, yeah. It, it shouldn't be the problem. It's just the fact that the, um, this entire screen right here is very compressed. You can see how like oh. tiny you can see these, the code here. So there needs to be yeah. a way to kind of zoom out a little bit. Um, so shiny actually has room to render. Okay. Okay, that, that's fine. Um, as long as I, I will yeah. use the same technique, you know, in my own desktop. Yeah. So thanks okay. very much. Yeah, thanks yep. a lot. Um, Ryan, how did you um, mark the screen sharing? That's a nice. <laughs> it is a there's a feature in uh, Zoom um, called annotate, so you can actually um, draw on the Zoom screens. Right. Okay. I'll, I'll I'll look for that. Thanks very much. Um, I'll I'll put it back to only you can screen share now, Ryan. Okay. Um, just uh, cool. um, yeah, and we got about three or so minutes still, so feel free to and grab some more coffee or what have you. I'm actually gonna grab some more water. I'll be right back, but we're gonna start yeah, start yeah. at the top of the hour. Yeah, it's great, Ryan. Yeah. There's one question here from Pablo. Hi, Ryan, can I ask a quick question about the number of colors you can use in building KPIs in China? Yeah, Pablo, if you want to ask your question quick, um, and then we can jump into the next section. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. It's just, um, I've got a, I've got a small shiny app that I built in, and it's put it, um, I just publish on, on my GitHub account, it's still working, so it's, it's, it's temporary. Uh, but basically, I, I've, I've noticed that there is like, uh, not, I mean, I, I've not been able to use like a wide range of colors for KPIs when designing them. So I wanted just to know if there is any kind of approach to choose the number of colors of if it is limited when building KPIs. Uh, this is this is the app. I just wonder what's the friend, the general take on choosing the colors and uh, I mean having bigger range of colors for the KPIs. Yeah. Uh, when, when you say KPIs, uh, I'm not sure if I know what a KPI is. Oh, sorry. Um, I've just pasted the 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 link in the chat so you will see a, a screenshot of the of the images uh, Ryan, kpis are just uh, think of it as the key performance indicators on a dashboard 
So this is a performance that dashboard for KPIs, key performance. Gotcha. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so you're looking just for like additional colors for like um, the bars and the lines and that kind of stuff or? Yeah, because I, I was, I don't really interpret and I think actually there were some, some kind of um, restrictions in the number of colors that you can use in the info boxes. So it's just to know a little bit more about uh, how to expand you. the colors or how to use info boxes with a wide range of colors. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I will say off the top of my head, I'm sure there absolutely is a different ways to define exactly what colors those info boxes should be. Um, that, that being said, do I know it off the top of my head exactly if there's a limitation or how many you can actually choose from? I'm not sure, but um, we can I can try to maybe dig up that info for you. Uh, but yeah, it seems like a, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. And just, I was wondering like, sorry, my second question is like, when you design this, this um, info boxes and do you always recommend to use CSS to change the colors or just to default to the original um, setup for the for the info boxes? Yeah, I mean, you certainly could use CSS to really customize your application. Um, again, but what I'm not entirely sure is that it built into Shiny when building those uh, info boxes, if there's any more options for additional colors. Uh, but you can certainly do it using customized CSS for sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, folks, let's go ahead and gear up for the second part of our talk. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. Let me get here in presenter view. All right, so we'll close out this section of Workbench. All right, so here we are, I'm back in my instance of RStudio Cloud, All right? So this is that original link that I shared in the chat. Now, if you remember, when you clicked into that workspace instance, there were actually two assignments. So if you click on Shiny in the top left, this will bring you back to the home screen. And there's going to be a second assignment called Advanced Shiny. So there's going to be a lot of interactive applications that you can try out for yourself uh, within this project. So go ahead and click on this project and give it a few seconds here to spin up um, so you have this session running. Um, and then uh, for anyone that joined a little late, I don't know if um, Priyanka or Mohammed, if you want to just reshare that um, cloud instance link again. Oh yeah, sure. All right, cool. All right, so I'll be coming into this RCDU cloud instance a few different times here um, uh, as we go through uh, the advanced shiny section. All right, so advanced shiny, or what I like to call this uh, presentation, probably more applicable shiny tips and tricks. It's really going to be focused on taking your shiny applications to the next level. Uh, in other words, making your shiny applications really shine. We're going to talk about a lot of different things. Again, some of it will be more uh, advanced topics, but some of them will be, you know, even for a beginner, you can actually try it out for yourself. So I'll quickly go over some of the resources that I use to create this presentation. But for the most part, this presentation is just going to be a review of what I consider some of my top tools, packages, strategies for advancing your Shiny applications. Things like customizing the user interface, right, which is probably usually the most exciting parts of Shiny. Uh, things like troubleshooting when things go wrong, creating tables, interactive plots. Uh, and then we'll also talk about things like developing your Shiny app uh, and performance testing. So again, I do have that instance of RStudio Cloud. I'll be switching gears to that uh, environment numerous times. I'll try to go slow to make sure everyone is um, you know, up to speed with what I'm opening, what I'm running. Um, but if at any point I'm going too fast, just scream into the chat, let me know that I'm going a little too fast and I'll, I'll kind of repeat myself here. All right, so for this presentation, Advanced Shiny, uh, we're still going to be focusing on you know, I'm gonna be focusing on delivering content to the R programmer. Now I'm gonna assume that you're either uh, proficient at R or maybe you're new to R, but I'm really just gonna be focusing on R. Now, if you really want full control over your Shiny applications, knowing some HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, these other programming languages will be helpful. That being said, you know, I've been creating applications for years now. I still don't know any HTML, JavaScript, and very little CSS. Uh, and I still think I created some pretty cool shiny applications. So you can get away with just knowing R. You don't need to know these languages. 
But as you maybe look through that gallery I showed in the beginning of last presentation and maybe saw some really cool stuff that was likely done with the help of some of uh, these other languages as well. And then finally, just to recap some of the resources, um, and I will share these slides afterwards, so don't worry about you know copying. These actually are all embedded links, but that Mastering Shiny book, I can't recommend enough. There's also another great book. It's slightly outdated at this point, but it was written by one of our software engineers here at our studio, um, really for just creating uh, visualizations using R and Plotly and Shiny, things we'll all talk about today. Uh, we also do have a conference we host yearly uh, way back in 2019 we had a really cool shiny and production workshop all that material is online you can check it out so for this talk uh, we're going to be talking about taking your shiny application to the next level and we are going to focus mostly on this old faithful guide your data application what we created in the last hour and we're going to talk about improving this application in really three different facets we're gonna talk about the user experience. So if you share your application with somebody, how do you improve what they can see, what they can touch? Also improving the developer experience. So for a lot of the folks on the line and you're thinking about creating a Shiny application, how do you, you know, what are some ways that you can think about developing your Shiny application uh, using different strategies? And then we'll talk about, you know, something uh, that gets often overlooked is the Shiny app itself. How do we improve the performance? How do we optimize our Shiny application so it remains performant as you share it with, you know, one person, 10 people, 100, 1,000, 10,000 people? Uh, those are all important things to consider. So these are really subtopics. We're going to step through all of them, and we're pretty much just going to start over here on the left-hand side. We're going to talk about customizing the user interface. Uh, so basically making the theming look a little bit better, changing these user inputs and outputs. This is typically the most fun part about Shiny, kind of customizing the UI. So let's dive right into it. We're gonna start with themes, right? Themes is a really simple way to dramatically change the layout, the view, the color scheme, fonts of your applications. Now there's three packages that I'm gonna highlight. These are certainly not the only ones that can change the theme of your Shiny application, but I think these three are a good starting point. The first package is something known as Shiny Themes. So like I just mentioned, this is in fact another open source package. So we need to install it and then load it like you would any other package. And to change the theme of your application within the fluid page function of your Shiny app, we need to add a theme argument and then we feed it one of the various themes from this package. So shiny theme, and then you can do cerulean, you can do darkly. And here you can actually see on the right-hand side, a screenshot of all of the various themes for your shiny application. So I want all of you to try this out. Uh, if you want, again, feel free to just kind of sit back, relax and watch me go through it. But in this instance of advanced shiny, you wanna go back to the home directory of our project. You can always do that by clicking this little R button. So make sure you select the files tab and click on this little R button that takes you back to the home directory. And we have shiny themes, all right? So click on shiny themes directory and we just have a single app within this directory. All right, so over here, let me make my screen a little bit bigger. Let me just quickly run through how to incorporate a shiny theme into your application. So like I mentioned before, we need to load the shiny themes package. And then right here on line 14, we have our fluid page function and we just have to change up this argument. All right, so we have a theme argument and we feed it a shiny theme and you can choose darkly or any of the ones you see listed directly below. So I have it set to darkly where you can go ahead and I can run this application. And here is that same Old Faithful Geyser data application in a dark theme. So I want everyone to do here, and again, you want to stop your application in between, is go ahead and replace this darkly with any of these values you see down here. Play around with it. Find a theme that you think looks pretty cool. I'll give you about a minute or so to play around with these various themes.
All right, so feel free to take another 20 seconds or so to play around. I'm actually just gonna change one up for some fun. I'm gonna pick, uh, let's try Space Lab. And I'll run this application, see what that looks like. Well, it looks pretty similar to our original one. Let's pick one that's more interesting. Maybe Superhero. There you go, looks a little different. All right. So hope you had the chance to maybe find your favorite theme. But again, I just want to just demonstrate that using this package with just a few lines of code, you can completely change the theme, the feel, the look of your application. All right, so I'll go ahead and close this application and come back to my home directory over here. Let's go back to our slides. So this other package that I'm going to mention here, this is one of my personal favorite packages. And I think it's a package that probably not a lot of people know about. It's something called thematic. And I think many folks on the line, those that are uh, a little bit more artistically um, savvy, may have noticed that when we change the theme to a dark format, it still looked pretty ugly. So what do I mean by that? So this example, this flow right here, I'm showing on the right hand side, we had this application showing a single plot and you had these various tabs at the top. This looks nice. It has a nice white background. It's a white plot. If we change our theme to a darkly theme, we get something that looks like this. You can see our application, like kind of the background is this dark format, but the plot itself is still white. And this looks really ugly. By using thematic, it's basically like turning on a light switch. You can turn thematic on by calling thematic shiny. And what it will do is automatically detect the theme of your shiny app and match all the outputs to that theme. So without changing all the code in the actual plot, I can just run thematic shiny. And you can see here in this example, the plot has automatically been themed to the theme that you defined. So let's go ahead and show you how this works. So going back to our studio cloud, at the very bottom of here, we see a thematic directory. Click on this single application. Just to quickly run through the code here, I'm gonna reload the shiny themes package, but I'm also going to load the thematic package. So it's another open source package. And then on line 14, again, think of it like turning on a light switch. We are turning on thematic. And once we do that, hopefully all of our outputs will match the ever, whatever theme we define. So we're gonna use a darkly theme, all right? So we're using the same code we did in the last example. And now if I run this application, this looks much better. All right, so you can see it has a, a nice match theme and the shiny application behaves just like it normally did. And I can try to change this up. So if I maybe do superhero and run this application, you can see how it automatically detects a theme and matches those outputs. So it's a really nice way so you don't have to go in and manually change all of your plots to match the theme. You can just flip on thematic and it'll do it for you. All right, so I'll close this application, come back to our file home directory. And coming back to the slides, we have one more package to talk about. And in this progression of these packages, we talked about shiny themes, which is really just gives you some good cookie cutter starter uh, ways to theme your application. Thematic is kind of your next step to really start to tweak your theme. BSLib is taking full control over the theme, All right. So in this GIF right here, I'm showing an example of a application that comes pre-built into the BSLib package. Basically, this is an R package that provides a wrapper to various bootstrap themes. All right? If you've heard of bootstrap themes, hopefully this is exciting to you. If not, don't worry about it. Basically, it just gives you full um, customization over your Shiny application. And you can do some really cool things. Like for example, here is a BS theme. Um, so it looks a little kind of scary, but you can actually just ways to automatically generate this. I'll show you that here in a second. Um, but here is a theme that basically takes your application and makes it kind of like this cool retro Game Boy look. So it's kind of a cool way um, that you have full control of your Shiny applications. So I'm going to come back to our Studio Cloud and we're going to show you an example of BS Live, basically how you can spin up this application to change the theme. So right here we have our BS Live directory. We have a single app. Now let's go ahead and run this application. I'll make my screen a little bit bigger. And this application allows you to automatically create a theme, all right? So you can see over here on uh, the right-hand side, we have our theme customizer. We can change the various colors. So if you wanna change the overall theme, let's maybe do that superhero theme. I kind of like that. 
That looks good. Foreground color, we can change it from this gray. Maybe we can make it a little bit darker. Yeah, it looks okay. Maybe not best color in the world, but that's fine. And you can do some other things as well. So I can change like accent colors. So this button right here, maybe I want to make it more, let's make it orangey color. Actually, it's pretty good. But you get the idea. You can come in here and you can change how you want the appearance of your shiny application to look. And as you do that, some folks may have noticed that over here in the console, it actually spits out the theme for you. All right, so all you would have to do is copy this and paste it into the Shiny application that leverages BSLib. And it'll automatically update the theme to match this layout that you defined down here. All right, so that is BSLib. And as kind of a sneak peek, we actually do have some really exciting updates coming to the BSLib package. There's a lot of active development with this package. So definitely stay tuned for some more updates there. All right, so that is kind of my top three packages for themes. Uh, let's talk a little bit about inputs and outputs. We're gonna focus on inputs to start. I'm not gonna talk about a bunch of ones, uh, but really I just wanna highlight one package because I think it's really simple and also pretty powerful. And that's called Shiny Widgets. So here's the same little image I showed on our last presentation. We have all these pre-built inputs into your Shiny applications, like that slider bar, for example, we talked about. But if you want your inputs to be a little bit more flashy, a little bit more fun, there's a package called Shiny Widgets, which allows you to create various inputs like you're seeing down here. So you can have these cool checkboxes, click me's, primary buttons. You can see a slider bar it looks a little bit better because you get a little label here. But you can also do some cool things like um, here is a output, a plot. You can click on this gear icon. You actually get kind of this uh, menu that flies in, you can change your X and Y axis, and then you click outside and it flies off the screen. It's a really good space saving technique. And it's all encapsulated within shiny widgets. You can also do some cool things like create alerts to your users. Uh, and this is a really good technique because many times if a user clicks on something, it may just kind of freeze and the user doesn't know if it actually is working, if it's thinking, or if it's actually frozen. So you can create various alerts, like good alerts, bad alerts, or rather kind of sweet alerts using HTML, uh, really whatever you want. So let's go ahead and I'll show you an example of leveraging Shiny Widgets. And this is a pretty simple example. So we're gonna click on files, come back to our home screen, and we have Shiny Widgets right here. I'll click on this application. And so at the very top, I'm loading the Shiny Widgets package, and I'm going to replace our slider input. So here we have our sidebar layout, we have our sidebar panel, and originally we had that slider input, but now we're gonna replace it with something from Shiny Widgets called a knob input. And you get a lot more arguments. We still have the input ID, we still have the label, the min, max, default values, but now we get all these other options for Shiny Widgets. So if we run this, here is what our Shiny application now looks like. So the functionality is still the same, but now we're leveraging a shiny widget. So I can slide this to the right, slide this to the left, and you can see how that changes the number of bins in our histogram. All right, so again, if you're looking for more pizzazz with your shiny inputs, shiny widgets is a really great starting point. All right, so that was the only package I wanted to highlight for inputs, um, but I wanted to spend some time talking about outputs, specifically tables. I think tables are one of the most um, important parts of conveying your data. So everyone loves to create plots, but tables I think is really where um, you know the money's at. So the nice thing about tables and especially with Shiny applications, they don't need to be interactive. They can just be static tables, but there are some packages for creating interactive tables uh, that can be leveraged within Shiny. The first one that I'm gonna talk about is a package called DT. And this is actually a wrapper to a JavaScript library called data tables. So, and this is a cool thing. I mean, if, if um, just to kind of drive that point home is you don't need to know JavaScript. A lot of these packages like DT are wrappers around JavaScript. So again, you only need to R code, but it still incorporates JavaScript into your applications. So here's an example DT table from the Iris data set, which is another built-in data set to R. And you can see it has really nice kind of coloring with the rows. You can um, sort on the various columns. You can search, which is really powerful. And it's also paginated as well. So if you have a really big data set and don't want to take up the entire screen, you can create various pages. 
So DT is awesome. One of the other cool features about DT that I don't think a lot of folks know about is you can actually have a DT table, which is shown over here on the left-hand side, serve as an input for another output. So what do I mean by that? So here on this table, you can see in this GIF, I'm actually clicking on various rows, so various observations. And once I do that, it actually serves as an input to highlight those points on this plot, which I'm showing over here on the right-hand side. So this is a really cool concept. It's something known as crosstalk. And there's actually a whole nother package built around this concept of crosstalk, but it's know that you can do it using the DT package. Now, if you don't want to leverage interactive tables and you're looking for more static tables, uh, I can't recommend a package called GT enough, all right? GT is super cool. And if you are familiar with creating plots using the ggplot um, functionality, the, uh, the package, then using GT will come very naturally. But let me kind of explain some of the code underlying GT to generate this plot or this table you're seeing in the bottom right. So kind of going down by halfway, you can see this SP500. That's our data set. We just do some simple filtering and selecting, but then you pipe it into a GT function. This is just like piping a data set into a ggplot function. And once you've created this GT object, that's when you can start customizing your table, such as adding a tab header or formatting the date or currency or number, ultimately to create a table that looks something like this. And this is, you know, this is a production grade uh, table. So something that you need um, is something for scientific publication or just want to make really nice um, uh, publishable tables, GT is the way to go. So here are some other examples of GT. This actually is coming from uh, the mock-up blog. This is from one of my colleagues, Tom Mock. Uh, he's kind of done a deep dive into GT and some of the cool things you can do with it. So I described a few screenshots, like you know, bordering certain uh, lines in your plot. You can create heat maps. You can change the colors depending if they're positive or negative. Change the text. Or you, I really like this one on the bottom right because even though it's really simple, it has a nice footnote in here, and this is something you would see in like a scientific publication. Uh, so I think GT is just a, just a fantastic package, and there's certainly a lots of development going into it. But on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, if you're not looking for a static table and you want full interaction, you want to be able to do a ton of stuff with your tables and interact with your tables in a thousand different ways, then Reactable is the package you want to go with. So here's an example table built using Reactable. And this actually replicates a table. Some people on the line may have heard of a website called 538. This, pack, this uh, website creates really cool data visualizations and tables. And this is a replication of one of those tables using the Reactable package. You can see you can do some additional cool things like embedding images in the various cells. You can highlight the numbers depending if they're high value or low value, heat maps, sorting on the columns. You can do a ton of stuff with Reactable. All right, so those are my top three for tables. And then I'm only going to highlight one for plots, uh, just because I think um, plots tell a really good story. Um, but it's a really simple way to add an additional layer of interactability with your plots, and that's known as Plotly. And I'm sure some folks have probably heard about this. And I'll, I'll mention again this resource written by Carson Siever, where he kind of takes a deeper dive into Plotly. But here is a simple ggplot. So on the y-axis, we have MPG in miles per gallon, and then we have WT over here on the x-axis. And you can see the various observations, these black points. We have this also kind of line uh, fit through here. But with the help of Plotly, you can see as I hover my mouse over the various points, it actually gets a little interactive pop-up that shows the X and Y coordinates. So this is a very simple example, but it's a great way and certainly things you can build upon to add that additional layer of interaction to your Shiny applications, uh, to those plots in your Shiny applications. All right, so that wraps up the user interface, all right, and improving the themes, the inputs and outputs. We're gonna switch gears to the designer experience. And I think this will probably speak to a lot of folks on the line here that either have developed Shiny applications or are just looking to get started. So the first tool that I wanna talk about is something known as Gollum. This is another open source package. It was actually built by our collaborators in France at ThinkR. Column is a framework for creating production grade Shiny applications. So if you think you have an application that may be leveraged by hundreds, thousands of people all at the same time, 
then there's certainly a good reason that you should check out the Golem package. I'm not gonna go deep dive into Golem, but it does come with a cheat sheet to kind of get you going, to have those uh, various functions ready. Um, but just know that it's a way to, basically a framework for creating these production grade Shiny applications and it comes with a lot of added benefits. Uh, so I'd certainly recommend checking this out for those uh, large Shiny applications your team's working on. The next thing I wanna talk about is something known as Shiny modules. Now this is not a package, this is actually a technique for your Shiny applications. So to quickly explain why Shiny modules is important, let's take a look at this uh, image I'm showing here kind of in the middle left-hand side. Let's just say this is an example of Shiny application and this Shiny application does a variety of things. It has uh, some things up here for managing your session, uploading data, HPC settings, uh, you know, results down here. And even though this is not particularly complex, you can start to see these arrows that you know, some components are talking to other components, the arrows are starting to intersect. And very quickly, it's getting pretty confusing. So if you find that your application is getting larger and larger, and it's getting harder to debug or figure out you know, where my application, certain things are being uh, run, then you may wanna think about breaking your Shiny application into something known as modules. So we can take this application and group things that are related. So for example, all those components related to the session can be one module, the data can be another module, HPC results, all their separate module. And these modules can be run independently to the rest of your Shiny application, which makes it really easy for debugging and troubleshooting. Another good way to think about what modules are, if those in the line are familiar with writing functions in R or really any language, but for functions, it's a way to take code that you've written maybe a hundred thousand times, and just put into a single function. So it's reusable code, but you can only use a function either in the user interface or the server. But if you want a function that can span the user interface and the server and basically talk between those two, that is what a module is, right? It's, it's a, basically a function that spans the user interface and the server. And the last technique I'm going to talk about, one of the simplest methods for improving um, your the developer experience, but also the Shiny app experience as a whole, is something known as caching. Now, caching does not work for all applications, right? But if you have an application that has a set number of outputs, so for example, maybe your application has one of five outputs that can be displayed. And let's say these outputs take a long time to generate. Maybe there has to be some large data transformation step or a machine learning model has to run. And if a user goes to generate that plot and it takes 30 seconds, a minute, now it's not a great user experience. So what you can do instead is something known as caching your outputs. And I like to think of it kind of like these tater tots from Napoleon Dynamite, uh, kind of an outdated movie at this point, but still funny nonetheless. So in this example, you have these outputs. These are basically like your tater tots. You cook them up once and then you stick them in your pocket. And when you're ready, when a, a user comes into your application and needs one of these outputs, you just unzip your pocket and grab out that tater tot and it's automatically ready. You don't have to cook up the tater tots again. So to put that in kind of uh, not Napoleon Dynamite terms, so the Shiny application will do the computation of a set number of um, kind of combination of inputs once to generate that output. And if it ever sees that combination of inputs again, rather than regenerating one of these plots, it'll just reach into a cache and deliver that plot for you. So it can dramatically speed up your application. All right, the next part we're gonna talk about is troubleshooting your applications. Now, troubleshooting Shiny is inherently a difficult thing. And that's because this concept of reactivity that we talked about before, where if you slide the input, it, you know, uh, uh, the Shiny application reacts to that. That concept is unique to Shiny. And because of that, if things go wrong with your reactivity, it can be hard to debug it. But fortunately, there's a nice tool that can help with debugging your Shiny applications, and that's called the React log. All right, so let me just go ahead and show you an example of the React log. So I'm gonna come back here, and let's go to our home screen. I think I, yeah, I have a React log script, so reactlog.r. We'll just step through this uh, and kind of show you what's going on here. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna load Shiny and I'm gonna load the React log package. So this is another open source package. I'm going to enable it. That basically starts a recording. I right? think of it as hitting the record button on your, your cell phone, for example. 
We then run an application. So we're going to run that basic shiny application that have in my, this basic app directory. And then once we're done interacting with it, we'll stop it. And then we're going to show that React log. So let's go ahead. I'm going to run everything here up to the shiny app. All right, and the only thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to slide this bar to the left. And that's it. Now hit stop. Now let's go ahead and show the shiny React log. So it should open up a new tab. All right, so I got a ton of stuff here. That's because I've actually I had a bunch of applications we've run since then. So I'm actually going to come back here. I'm going to restart my R session. Start with a nice blank slate. Let's just do that all over again. So I'll rerun this application. Slide this to the left. Hit stop. And now we'll show the React log. All right, just a little bit simpler. So again, I'm not going to dive into this you know, nitty gritty details of what we're showing here, but in essence, we are visualizing the reactivity of our Shiny app, right? Something that's inherently very hard to visualize, but this uh, tool does its best to help you out. So on the left-hand side, we have all the various inputs, right? You can see our input dollar sign bins. There's also a few other inputs that are kind of needed by Shiny underneath the hood um, that you don't have to worry about, but you can step through the reactivity. So up here at the top, you have these various controls. So I hit the play button once, you can see the inputs has changed. So from, it went from 30 to 16, and this becomes grayed out. That basically means it's then invalidated, right? And that triggers reactivity. And we can just keep stepping through all the various components. You can see over here, our output is now invalidated, right? That disk plot, our histogram. We can keep stepping through it. I'm not gonna worry too much about all this stuff, but eventually everything gets rebuilt the point where everything is nice and green and happy and our plot is being rebuilt with this uh, input value of 16. So if you do suspect that something's going wrong with the reactivity of your Shiny application, we'd recommend using a React log to visualize some of that reactivity to see what's going on. All right, the next um, method for troubleshooting Shiny applications is actually a little bit simpler. And this is something known as showcase mode. So it's not a package, it's just a different way to view your Shiny applications. One of the hardest parts of debugging Shiny applications is that when it's running, it's actually behind a web server. So you can see the user interface, but you actually can't see the code that's being run behind the scenes. With the showcase mode, you actually can. So in this GIF here, you can see my applications running on the left-hand side. And as I change these various inputs, all the code that's being executed gets highlighted here. It kind of flashes yellow for a second. So this is a great way to see if maybe some code is being run that shouldn't or vice versa. Some code uh, is not being run and should. So let me quickly show you how to do this. I'm going to come back to RCD Cloud. Let me close this React log script. Go back to files and we have showcase mode. So we're just going to use this run app function to run that same application we just ran for the React log. But most importantly, I have display mode equals showcase. So I run this. Here we have our Shiny application. Um, you can see all the codes down here. I can like to see show with app. And if I scroll down to the server portion, as I interact with my Shiny application, so I slide the bar to the left, slide to the right, you can actually see all the code that's being executed as I interact with my Shiny application. So a great way to kind of get a peek behind the curtain as your Shiny app is currently running. All right, so a few more things to talk about, and then we'll wrap things up. So we've talked about the user interface, you know, the theming, the inputs, outputs. We've talked about the developer experience, so um, developing your Shiny apps, um, strategies for, um, uh, for debugging and troubleshooting. But now let's actually talk about um, the Shiny app itself. So oftentimes, you know, you may have an application that's going to be delivered to not, not just yourself, but maybe to your colleagues, maybe a bunch of people at work, or maybe it's something you're going to make public that could be consumed by thousands of people at the same time. And that can be scary because you don't know how your application is going to scale. Can it actually accommodate 10, 100, 1,000 people all at the same time? So just know that there is a tool to help you out with this, all right? and it's called Shiny Load Test. I won't go into the details of how to actually run a Shiny Load Test. I just want to show an example of what the results could be. So here is a plot, an output from a Shiny Load Test of an application. 
And the biggest benefit of shiny load tests is you get to simulate users. We call synthetic users to your application. So for example, here I have a plot that I simulated four users to my application. So think of these as four separate people that logged into my application at the exact same time. You can see the time that they're on this application ranges, you know, zero to 600 or so seconds. And then all these colored bars you see in these rows, this represents time the Shiny app is thinking, right? Basically the Shiny app is unresponsive. It's doing some kind of analysis. And these gray kind of spaces you see in between represent time the Shiny application is ready for more input. So ideally, what you want to see is an application where more of the gray background is showing through this plot and these colored bars, whether it be blue, red, orange, or green, are very thin. So as you continue to add more simulated users, so we have, again, four in this example, you can do 10, you can do 1,000, you can do 10,000. Ideally, you want to see a lot of that gray showing through. But if it kind of shows up as a blue block, that basically means your application is unresponsive to that many users. So shiny load test, it's a great way for testing to see how your application scales. Well, let's say, for example, you find that your application doesn't scale. Well, what do you do next? All right, you want to use something known as a profiler uh, and there's a package in um, R called profviz, which is a profiler. It basically allows you to see what parts of your application are computationally heavy. So you can kind of figure out ways to improve the performance of your application. So this is just a GIF of uh, an example of running a ProfViz. So I've run ProfViz, I have my application. I can then you know, slide the bar left and right. I can click on some of the buttons, some of the tabs, I interact with it. And then when I close it out, it generates a report. All right? So this is an example report of ProfViz. I won't go into details into everything that's being shown here. Um, let me just go ahead and just show you an example, a much simpler example of what ProfViz can show you. So this is not actually a shiny application, but the behavior would be exactly the same. So here in the very top, we have this profviz function. And within profviz, we have a data set. And we're going to do the same thing to this data set four different ways. We're going to calculate the column means. So we have, you can use the apply function to do this. You can use call means, you can use L apply, you can use B apply. But again, all four of these lines do the exact same thing. But from the profiler's perspective, they actually are very different. You can see here that this apply function actually uses the most amount of memory, so being allocated or deallocated, and it actually takes the longest time to run. As opposed to v apply, which is a vectorized operation, takes hardly any memory and it can go in about a tenth of the time. Okay. So again, this is a great way to just visualize what parts of your application, what functions, what inputs, what outputs are taking particularly long to compute and which are using a lot of memory so that you can think about ways to improve the performance of your application. All right, so that's pretty much all I have for this session. It's a little bit of a shorter session, but hopefully a good primer and some ideas, thoughts about how you can start improving your application. But really, I just scratched the surface. There are so many awesome tools out there for improving the theme, interactivity, data connections, performance of your application. And I'm just listing a few of these right here. Uh, one that I do want to highlight, because it's a relatively new resource, this outstanding Shiny UI book. Creating cool user interfaces for your Shiny applications are probably the most fun part about Shiny. And there's this brand new book, again, called Outstanding User Interfaces, uh, written by uh, David Grandin, who works at Novartis. Um, and he has a great way to just kind of get started with more advanced theming of your applications. So starting to incorporate JavaScript, CSS into your applications. And this is a free online book, just like that advanced Shiny session. All right, but a lot of other cool packages too. I mentioned that crosstalk uh, package where you can highlight points on one plot and actually highlight those same plots on, or points on another plot. Something we didn't talk too much about today, which is still very important, because most times when I talk to folks and they are saying, oh, my Shiny application is really slow. How do I improve it? I'd say 50, 60, 70% of the time, it's because they're working with huge data sets. So if you find that you're working with a Shiny application that's reading in a ton of data, you might want to think about some alternative ways to make that data uh, incorporation step a little bit more efficient. And we have a few examples and tools to help you out with that. So with that, I will go ahead, I'll stop sharing and see if folks have any questions.
Uh, Ryan, just what people are thinking. So uh, just a very big thank you, by the way. That's mm -hmm. been an amazing uh, overview of uh, from advanced, from basic to advanced <laughs> in, in two hours. So, so well done. Uh, there are obviously people thanking you on in the chat. But if anybody's got questions or comments, uh, please, this is a good time to do that. And don't sign off because uh, colleagues also, um, there's a um, feedback form, please. Uh, the feedback form is really valuable to us uh, as a part of the community, but also to the presenters, really. I think mm -hmm. that you know, put a huge amount into, into um, sharing knowledge and to, to, to get some feedback on how it's gone. So I've put the link to the, to the form. It's a very short form. So please do complete that. And we do have some hands up for questions. So um, uh, uh, it just says 00134. I don't know how to pronounce that. So please feel free oh, to- ask. Sorry, I don't know why it's not showing up as my name is Lara. I was trying to change. Sorry, I'm just going with Lara. Oh, great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, do, uh, well, do sorry, ask a question yeah. and then we'll move on, yeah. Yeah, it's just, you know, thank you very much, Ryan, for the presentation. It's very great. You know, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to know, most of the resources, where can I find it? Um, you know, I'm still, I'm not new to our, but I don't use it regularly. So I want to try and use it more regularly. So I want to see where can I get these resources? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great and question. More yeah. Yep. So again, I'll probably share with uh, Muhammad after this, um, the slides for today, and those have a few resources built into them. Um, but it's still, again, my biggest recommendation has to be this Mastering Shiny book. So even if you're brand new to Shiny, uh, this is still a really great resource because it walks you through everything from creating your very first Shiny application to more advanced topics as well. Um, if you're also, if you just go to shiny.rstudio, Oops, our studio, not pi, but just.com. We do have a whole website on Shiny, uh, and it should, it is a section on getting started. All right, so if you just want to learn how to get started with Shiny, uh, there's some really um, kind of good walkthroughs, tutorials for learning more about Shiny. Um, so that would be, probably be my two top recommendations would be mastering Shiny and then our shiny.rstudio.com. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And can you send us the link for the book, please? Can you put it in the chat? Oh, the I'll link for the book. Yeah, I'll, I'll do thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. If there's anybody else with a question, please do feel free. All right. Pablo has a question. Go ahead, Pablo. Sorry, yes. I just have a quick question. Um, What's your thought about like the modularity when you are building shiny apps? Like any any thoughts about how modular shiny apps should become? How modular? They're asking the modulars. Like, modules? I mean, how do you split a shiny app in different models? Or what's the very way of of knowing how to build like a shiny app using, for example, using the source function to call different components of the shiny app? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. There's, there's certainly kind of a lot of thoughts on you know, how you want to design your Shiny application, because that's ultimately what it comes down to. Um, you know, what I think Pablo is kind of referring to is you may have, for example, a bunch of functions you've created that are custom to your application, and you may want to source those functions into your application at, upon startup. So there are certainly ways to do that as well. Um, and then also creating modules. Uh, modules, it can be a little bit tough to get started with modules. They can be a little bit hard to grasp, but once it clicks, honestly, all applications should really, uh, you should consider using modules for uh, for Shiny applications. Um, but I, I can't necessarily speak exactly to like, you know, you should be using this or shouldn't be using that. It's really up to you and how you want to design them. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. If there are no more questions, do please complete the, um, uh, the evaluation form. And uh, oh, Zahi, yes, please do ask your question. Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, I clicked the wrong button. Uh, just a quick question about um, 
the server is there any uh, i mean uh, any limitation to how many can get access to the server when you publish uh, you know the shiny things mm. you're talking about rcu connect like the connect server yep yep okay. so i apply it had to be a question either by for muhammad or someone who potentially has um the admin for rcu connect okay yeah i mean that that that's a product that you you purchase um from our studio and obviously when you purchase it then you purchase it with a particular capacity so okay um, okay uh, but the um uh, uh, but our shiny apps can run on the free r studio server but they're obviously limited right okay yeah that makes sense thank you thank you well, thank you, everybody. Um, uh, so I will now draw the session to a close. Can I just ask you to give a virtual round of applause to Ryan, please? This has been a great effort, much appreciated. And uh, and as always, we're always grateful for our studio support to the NHS, our community. We'll have to stop calling them our studio now. They're positive, but I don't know what we're... Uh, uh, changing of vocabulary will take a little bit of time, but great to have your support, Ryan. Thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you uh, when you join the conference live. Uh, on the 16th and 17th of November in Birmingham, UK. Yep, we'll see you all in, uh, in person in a few weeks. Excited for it. And there's lots of spaces, folks, so please send your family, friends, anybody can come. Just find a way to, to register, and if you struggle, talk to me. <laughs> Great stuff. See you around, folks. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Have a lovely day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.